Hey everybody, my name is Akash the Kyra. Before we get into stuff, we're actually just gonna play a trailer of Hyperlight Drifter just to make sure everything's on the same page. One thing I wanna remind you of, or a couple things I wanna remind you of before we get started, turn off cell phones and noisemakers and all that sort of stuff, especially for an audio talk, that would kind of ruin the point of this if we hear your sweet Metal Gear codec ringtone during this, so. Keep that on quiet. Also, fill out those surveys that you'll get in your email after the fact when the CA scanned you in. You'll get a survey in your inbox about, like, how did you like this talk? And you're gonna rate us the highest possible and because you're gonna love this. It's gonna be the best. So, let's play a trailer of Hyperlight and then we'll get going. Looks good. Oh, whoa, whoa, oh no. Hold up. Thank you. <laughs> Goodbye. <Good one. laughs> You're good. uh, yeah, that's Hyperlight Drifter. Um, so uh, a little bit about us. My name is Rich Freeland. Um, I make sound and music uh, for media under the name Disasterpiece, and I've been doing that for about 11 years. And uh, Akash, <laughs> who are you? My name is Akash Thakar. I'm a sound designer working in games for about five or six or so like that. Rich and I actually went to school together. I met him by asking someone random in the hallway, like, where's the video game music club at the school? And it happened to be this guy. So. And Akash was a metal drummer, right? I was a metal drummer. He had hair right? down to like his feet. Yeah, had, like a super long hair <laughs> and a giant beard. And for the only straight edge person at a music school, I was always asked for drugs. It was, <laughs> it was, it was a treat. It was just a treat. Um, so I got onto this project literally just kind of in a funny way. So I already knew Rich already when the Kickstarter had already begun. It already got funded by the point I kind of got in touch with Alex Preston, the creative director. And I emailed Alex and Rich and said, like, do you, do you need a sound designer? I'll do good. I'll be good. Um, and Rich thankfully vouched for me. And you said, yeah, he'll... He'll be I all said, right. Yeah, he'll do a good job. He'll do a good job. And that was he'll kind be of, all right. He'll, he'll, be, he'll be all right. He'll be okay. <laughs> he'll be okay. Um, so that was kind of the end of the conversation. It kind of blossomed out of that, just me sending a couple quick emails to Rich and Alex. Thanks to you, that all panned out. But how did, how did you get on it? So I had a friend who, uh, who does music as well for games and, and does game development who was a friend of Alex, the creative director. And uh, I guess they were talking about the project. And uh, Alex knew that my friend knew me, and so he wanted to get in touch with me through my friend, and my friend was uh, happy to uh, put us in touch, but also a little sad, I think, that, uh, that he didn't get to work on the project. <laughs> but this was like around the time of the Kickstarter. Cool, so that's kind of how, it's funny how just friends of friends of friends kind of. Yeah, it's very it meta. It's very, it's very meta. Um, so we're gonna get into quite a bit in this talk. We're gonna talk about music, sound design, experimentation, and all sorts of little bits of nitty gritty. Of course, we're gonna leave plenty of time for questions at the end, so, please feel free to ask those at the very end and we will answer them to the best of our ability. But let's start with the music. Uh, yeah, so uh, I wanted to talk about some of the initial experiments with music. Um, so the first thing I, I wanted to show was uh, the, uh, the very first thing that I wrote for this game, kind of the thing that, um, you know, after, after kind of seeing of, uh, footage of the game and, and kind of talking to Alex briefly about what, what the game was about, kind of the first, you know, initial sketch idea. So let's play that.
Oh yeah, so Alex kind of liked this one. And uh, it, it pretty much ended up in the game in uh, uh, a version that was pretty close to this. And it was a good just kind of initial step to kind of, you know, this was just, just seeing, just seeing and thinking about the world. Like I wanted to do something that was kind of uh, deep and dark and, and kind of had little, um, I don't know, kind of ambiguous details. And uh, so that was a good place to start. Um, you know, after that, we kind of tried to do some experiments. I had this idea where I wanted to run the entire soundtrack through, um, through cassette, a cassette deck to give it like a, like more of an analog sound. But um, doing that actually, it, it like makes the speed of the recording fluctuate. Uh, and so if you're trying to do dynamic music in a game where you have multiple layers of music that are moving through different uh, scenarios and are meant to stay in sync with each other, if you're using a cassette if you're running music through a cassette deck, um, you'll lose kind of the syn the synchronization of the layers. They'll all get like fall out of phase. So I had to scratch that <laughs> idea. It didn't really make sense. Um, okay, and then so in, in the beginning of the project, you know, I, I was right. Uh, something that I like to do is uh, sit at the piano and come up with lots of different ideas and just kind of uh, uh, try to let the the project inspire me and see what comes out. And it doesn't necessarily mean that the music that I write is going to be music that we use, but it's it's a good place to start and kind of helps open the dialogue between me and Alex, um, who's a creative director and had a you know was, uh, uh, had a pretty strong vision. So uh, I want to play for you kind of the original uh, theme that I came up with for the game that I was really excited about. Um, on the this is like a rough uh, 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 piano recording. Um, that was, uh, you know, e even though we didn't end up using that piece because um, it didn't, it wasn't, it wasn't quite right for any particular moment in, in, in the project, and that that happens quite a lot actually for me. I'll write this kind of sweeping piece of music that maybe encapsulates a lot of the ideas that I have about what what I want the aesthetics to be, what what kind of emotional things I'm trying to capture. But um, from a uh, from from like a practical standpoint, there's no there's nothing that I can like very directly assign that music to. Um, so in this case, it kind of helped. Uh, don't, don't worry about that right now. But uh, <laughs> uh, uh, when that, in, in that case, that piece helped with um, kind of establishing certain adjectives and ideas about the music. You know, so I wanted the music to be uh, uh, very dark, but also cinematic, and um, have this sort of impressionistic style, uh, kind of inspired by uh, impressionist music uh, composers like Ravel and Debussy and Satie. Uh, and and uh, things like that. So it was a good kind of just to get into the headspace and figure out, you know, what, what is this going to sound like? Um, and then so the last kind of initial experiment I wanted to talk about is um, I like to kind of experiment with the creative process and, and see if I can come up with new ways of coming up with material. And so uh, very, very early on in the process, uh, Alex really wanted to do um, an arena mode. And uh, of course, if you've played the game, you, you probably know that there there is an arena mode in the final version that's based on waves where you know you kind of have a bunch of enemies and then you, you clear you cl clear a room and then another another wave comes and so um, we were kind of planning to do this music system and I had a friend who gave me these cue cards uh, these flashcards with all the different notes uh, of uh, you know the chromatic scale and um, I kind of came up with this system where the bottom the bottom row of notes is like the bass and then you kind of uh, you kind of draw like a this is kind of hard to explain. You kind of draw like a tetronimo, like starting at the starting at the bottom, 
going up and then over three. And so the top four are like the, the, the right hand stuff, like, uh, like chords. And then the left, the one on the bottom on the left is the bass. And so y you have basically this idea of um, music that moves through every, basically moves through every tonality, like every key. And then it kind of loops back around. So this was kind of uh, uh, the starting point for this, this demo that I want to play, which is um, something that I wrote for. It was, a, it was a sketch for the kind of the arena mode very early on. So this piece we didn't end up using, but it helped solidify this idea of, of having up-tempo music in kind of battle sequences in the game. So when you fight bosses, you know, um, any sort of encounter that feels like that. And um, this was in the game while we were developing it for a couple of months. And it was during kind of a uh, convention season where um, they were taking the game around, the demo of the game, to different conventions. And, um, you know, Alex, the creative director, would be on the floor talking to people showing the game and this music would be running in the background and it was just like you know a 50 second loop and so he was hearing this music like probably 6,000 times <laughs> and uh, he's just he started he hated it by the end he really really <laughs> hated it and he's like nah 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 it's like so uh, I, I tried to like stick it back in towards the end of the game and uh, he's like well, what are you doing no you can't you can't do this I can't I have this like extreme negative reaction to the song so it never even though it's one of my favorite like ideas we never we never use it <laughs> that's funny all right, so let's talk a little bit about how the sound design also worked as well. So I already gave a talk at GDC Europe about some of this stuff, so I'm going to make sure not to retread the same ground. But there's some stuff I'd like to mention for those of you who are new. So for this game, we did a lot of experimentation on both ends. But for sound design, I decided to go with weird tech to get a lot of the sounds to sound kind of distorted and crunchy and kind of nightmarish, almost like some sort of Evangelion-ish, awful neon nightmare sort of thing. So one of the first things that I went to was a wire recorder, which is a 1950s recording device, which I'll show you in just a second. And it records onto this thin metal filament. So it looks almost like fishing wire. So it's before tape, it's before vinyl, all that sort of stuff. So it creates this really crazy distorted sound when you record directly directly onto this metal wire. And when I got this thing, it came with a whole bunch of recordings from the 1950s when this thing was built. So you could hear recordings of people playing the piano, a little girl learning a song for the first time, people listening to the radio, people talking about their experiences during World War II. I digitized all of it, so it's like a lot of cool historical sounds on this thing. So best $250 eBay purchase I've ever had. Um, I also made a microphone out of a stethoscope, which is the most normal thing I'm sure all of you have heard of. So now that no one's confused, let's move on. No, in all seriousness, I basically used that to record a whole bunch of sounds I couldn't get under otherwise. So things like quiet machines like fridges and freezers and my own blood, which I'm going to show you worked out as kind of an ambience near the end of the game. And I eventually ended up deciding to use samples over synthesizers. Not entirely. There were plenty of synths, like Massive and stuff, built into a lot of the layers of the sounds I ended up using. But the reason I decided to sample and record stuff using this uh, wire recorder or my stethoscope microphone or just field recorder or whatever mics I had handy was because it allowed me to have the sounds grounded a little bit in reality and then stylize out from there as opposed to kind of grabbing things from the ether with a whole bunch of just pure synthesizers. So that allowed me to make things sound really, really stylish, but a shotgun could still sound like an otherworldly shotgun, for example. And oh. I think that's cool too because the, the music is kind of like very sort of ambiguous yeah. and everything's trying to be like kind of 
otherworldly on some level, even right. though some of the ideas are rooted in reality, but, but I think it's a good counterbalance to yeah. have the sound effects be more. Everything kind of stuck out yeah. more as a result and separated itself in a good way. And also, most every sound was created from scratch. Uh, I barely used any library stuff. I maybe used a couple gunshots here and there as a bass, or a couple explosions here and there as a bass, but most everything I recorded from scratch in my one bedroom apartment and just like had a carp like just carpet covered in sand, just doing footsteps and all that sort of stuff. So that's kind of how the process went. But I want to show you this wire recorder thing that I mentioned earlier. So this thing built in the 1950s, and what I want to show you real quick is just a quick video of what this thing actually sounds like. So I'm going to play you a quick video of just a recording of some piano music that came onto this thing. <laughs> So that song was probably like brand new at the time, <laughs> which is crazy. Um, all the distortion and artifacts and stuff you heard of like it's slowing down and speeding up, that wasn't like the microphone freaking out or anything. That's what it sounds like when you record onto metal wire. The craziest part is that it can snap in half. That wire snaps all the time. And the instruction Dang. manual even goes like, it's gonna break. It tells you that it's going to break. <laughs> and when it snaps, like if you're close, it'll cut you, it'll cut you good. <laughs> and I'm serious. Do you like, have any I, scars? I, I don't have scars, but I've been cut on my hands like a good amount. Dang. And you have to physically take it and tie the metal filament back together. I don't know if any of you have tie, tried to tie metal back together like a shoelace. It's really hard. I'm glad this thing is deprecated and obsolete, but man, it gave a cool sound. So I'm going to show you some examples later. Um, but next up is this everyday normal looking device. Uh, <laughs> Is that a stethoscope attached to a regular microphone? Absolutely it is, sir. Okay. <laughs> Ingenuity. Um, so what I did was buy a cheap stethoscope off of Amazon um, for like five bucks. I think this was actually, yeah, five bucks-ish. Um, I cut off the little ear hole thingies, so it's just a straight tube, basically. And then looped that through a garden hose spigot, because why not? And then taped it, taped the hell out of it to a very cheap small diaphragm condenser microphone. So then the signal of the stethoscope goes direct in to that microphone. And I can record regular everyday things like blood or the conversations on the other sides of windows. You know, just regular everyday stuff. <laughs> you know, whatever tickles whatever, your fancy. There. Whatever I felt like that day. <laughs> um, so I'm, what I'm about to play you is a recording of my own blood, basically. So what I did was just hold it up to my wrist. And just it's about to get really personal. It's, it's going to get real. Um, and all I did was take that blood recording, pitch it down, and add distortion to it. And this ended up being a part of the ambience that was in the last boss battle, this kind of low rumble. So for those of you who've played it and beaten it, you've all listened to my blood. I'll never look at you the same way. <laughs> I may have some health issues that I need to get checked out. Um, but the cool thing is, is that a stethoscope has two sides to it, which I didn't know before I bought one. So the kind of larger flat side is a low frequency capturing ability. Like it, it, it has the ability to capture lower frequencies. And you can turn it around to the bell, which you're seeing kind of facing upwards there. And that captures higher frequencies. So you can choose getting your breath or your heartbeat and just turn it around that oh. way. So it's like a contact mic that you can kind of play around with. Oh. It's, it's pretty neat. I'm, I'm a big fan of it. Oh, okay. So we're going to talk about establishing a style and getting creative direction. Um, so how we use creative direction on this project, um, you know, we, uh, we kind of had to feel out the dynamics of, I feel like you have to feel out the dynamics of a, a relationship when you go into a project, figure out, you know, who's kind of, um, who's kind of the go-to person uh, or is it more democratic when it comes to, you know, the creative direction of a project. And so, um, in my experience, everyone tends to fall on some s sort of scale when it comes to uh, how they like to, uh, you know, have uh, direct a project, kind of ranging from, hey, you can do whatever you want, or to like, you know, uber control freak, um, uh, like an uber auteur. Um, and auteur is kind of a phrase that I think fits well. Um, an auteur is like someone, you know, usually a filmmaker who has a very singular vision about what they want and everyone's ideas kind of get funneled into them. And so uh, Alex, the creative director, in this case, I would call him a friendly auteur because he has a very singular vision, 
but he's also malleable to external ideas, and so he was he was really um, pleasant to work with. Um, yeah, and he yeah. was the first artist director I've ever worked with, which is a treat, honestly. So he could use a lot of emotional words and give a lot of good feedback, kind of from his background, and it worked really, really freaking well. I liked it a lot. There was no micromanaging happening, which was much appreciated, but he had opinions ready to kind of help both of us when either of us were stuck or maybe not hitting it as much as we could. I hit like version 40 on some of the sound effects, so there were times where his opinion was extremely helpful to get things all kind of settled away. So we kind of cross the streams a little bit throughout this whole project. Um, there are some musical sound design elements and some sound designy musical elements that came across all throughout the project and they just kind of popped up naturally. We never really discussed like, oh, I'm gonna do a musical sound design thing here or you're gonna do some sound designy yeah. musical thing there. Um, it's very natural, whatever kind of came up that we saw needed, needed some work. Um, so basically what I'd like to play for you is if you've played it, there's a sound that happens whenever you pick up a module and I decided to make it kind of a fun musical fanfare that isn't too positive, because this game is kind of dark. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing could sound too happy. Um, initially, though, it was kind of a, oh, let's make this sound kind of Zelda-ish. But if I went that far, then things did not work out well. We didn't want too much happiness in this game. So. It's like, you did it, but it's... It's pretty, still a pretty dark world, <laughs> so don't get too happy. Here's a moment of happiness for you, and back to it. Uh, yeah, and then uh, on the music front, you know, in my in my process of uh, of making music, uh, especially early on, you know, we were kind of concepting ideas for areas of the game that maybe didn't have any sound design yet, or um, you know, maybe Kosh put kind of a placeholder ambience there, and it, maybe it wasn't exactly what I wanted to explore. So we we kind of. Um, we kind of set out to explore things separately in some occasions. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, I wanted to play some sounds. This, this first sound is for um, uh, the, uh, the birds that live in the northern, northern region of the game. Um, they're kind of like cultish. And uh, I wanted to create this kind of like menacing sound of, of birds swarming uh, and use that as like a, as like a texture in the music. Um, so this is what that sounds like. Cool. Is it menacing? Very. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, we use that in the music, and, and down the line, we actually ended up kind of isolating some of these and, and using them as, ambi as like, straight ambience as mm -hmm. well. Um, the uh, next thing I wanted to play was uh, two versions of a track, and um, uh, the, the end of a track, just to show that, like, a lot of the music in the game, I'm kind of thinking about, like, the um, kind of the surroundings that the music is being used for, and, like, you know, are there, would there be animals in this environment? Um, you know, what, what does the air sound like there? You're kind of thinking, thinking of music as sound design and thinking of, you know, what are sort of the, uh, what are some of the things that I can achieve with the music that will help to establish the ambience? And so this piece that I'm gonna play is for a section of, um, in the uh, eastern region of the world where it's kind of this like, uh, uh, it's like a water, outdoor water temple. It's, there's like running water everywhere. Um, yeah, um, so uh, I'll play like the music, uh, the end of the song with everything, and then I'll play kind of the isolated version. <laughs> So there's like wind in there and hoots, like hooting sounds, like ambiguous animal sounds. So I'll, I'll play the isolated version now so you can hear them better. So just in general, I was trying to think of music as like as as mimicking rea the reality of the world, um, and that that wasn't just for like animal sounds and and 
wind or whatever. Um, you know, it was also for creating kind of uh, depth of atmosphere, like in some of the deeper regions. So and when you go underground, a lot of times you hear this like drum that's like really big and kind of far away. It sounds like this. So I use that same sound like uh, almost everywhere. <laughs> I tried to play that out of my laptop speakers and nothing came out, it's so deep. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and and it, it actually, I found that it worked really well in just kind of establishing like there's something like really far away from where you are right now that's happening or just something to create this sense of like really big, deep space. And I feel like that helped a lot. And then there are other sounds kind of of that ilk that do similar things. Like I had this kind of like this very far away like kind of electrical sound that I would use uh, from time to time to kind of give the same impression. And that sounds like this. It's, uh, it's kind of subtle, but um, in, in right moments, it kind of like comes out of the mix a little bit and just helps to establish the environment there. And then this other thing that I would do a lot is I would build these synth patches to use to play chords and melodies and things like that. But then I would like experiment with the sound um, because I have, I have all these effects on the sounds. If I go up like six octaves and try to play it, you get all these weird like like uh, like aliasing effects and stuff that I wasn't expecting. And so I use that a lot to kind of create kind of just weird, weird sounds. So um, this is a little shrill, so prepare yourselves. Oh, that wasn't too bad, huh? Yeah, it wasn't bad. <laughs> uh, yeah, cool. So there are some kind of more iconic sounds in this game, so we're going to talk about some of those. And Rich, your your stinger is probably the most yeah. well known. I can't I can't take all the credit for this because um, Alex and I had this process where at some point I was struggling a little bit to find the sound of this game, and so I we just started a Dropbox folder where I just threw like tons and tons of piano sketches into it. There are probably like 100, 150 sketches in there, and him and I would just listen to them and and talk about it and take notes. And he found this like he found this like three chord thing in one of the sketches and he's like this should be the theme and I was like you're right this is this is perfect so this is uh, this is what it was this is the piano version so we felt like it kind of did a lot it was very evocative in a very short period of time so that was something that we could probably latch on to mm -hmm. and so um, you know that turned into, uh, the first time that we got to use it was when we did the, the second trailer. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is, this is that in the context of the trailer. Press it again. <laughs> so it kind of worked, I think. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, a little bit, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, it, and uh, it's funny because uh, talking about trailers, you know, the kind of the um, uh, the aesthetic and timbre of the theme kind of came out of working on the trailer. And I have a lot of mixed feelings about working on trailers. I kind of prefer to work on the thing itself as opposed to getting caught up in trailers because sometimes you can take like weeks to get the trailer right, and it's very meticulous. Mm -hmm. But in this case, for this game, it was so important, like this trailer and the final trailer, which had the pia has piano in it, those were really important in kind of helping us to understand, you know, what it is sonically that we're trying to achieve with, with this game. All right, so next up is some of the weapon sounds, and I spent probably the most amount of time on making the weapon sound as cool as humanly possible. So to do that, I did a technique that basically all sound design uses, and that's called layering. So every time you hear any sort of sound effect in most any game or movie or any piece of media, every single sound is made up of multiple things playing at the same time. And the sound I'm about to play for you here is the diamond shotgun. And what that is is made up of nine different layers for each and every shot that you pull. And there's two different versions of this, but I'm just going to isolate one version for you. So in this video, this is just a video of me in Logic Pro, which is the software I used for all the sound design in this game. And basically, I just walk you through each layer to see what they sound like individually. 
And then at the very end, you'll hear how they all come together. And you might be wondering how I recorded a lot of this stuff. A lot of it is the result of that wire recorder, and that's how I could get kind of such strange, artifacty, kind of distorted sounds. So this will walk you through every layer, and then all together at the end. It's a little bassier in Let's here. Look at that flutter it. echo. Wow. That <laughs> yeah, that's that that delay is not actually a part of the effect. So if you're like, whoa, 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 that's not that's not a part of it. That's just this room. Um, so that's how I approached basically every single sound effect from the footsteps all the way to the weapon sounds to the monsters and everything in between is made up of sometimes as much as 20 different layers of sound. So every single weapon you hear, and that's kind of the trick in a way to make things sound unique or iconic or special to that world, is building it up of different elements that on their own can sound like they fit within that world, in this case like Hyperlight, but all together sound like its own cool, unique thing. And next up is the kind of monster effects so I've talked about this a little before, but this is Hal. He's the final boss of the game. This is an older animation, but it's a cool GIF, so I thought I'd throw it in here. Um, so for all the monster sounds, except for the wolves, uh, you're hearing my angelic voice being super processed. So all of the monster deaths and roars and all that sort of stuff, all of them screaming is... What, what sad soul did you ask to do the wolves, wolf voice? It's just, I just, I had her wolf recording. <laughs> Did you go find go searching for yeah, wolves? Yeah, I went searching for wolves. I have okay. a pack of my own anyway, so okay. I just I just recorded them. They're my friends. Just curious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know normal things. Uh, so for this um for this uh Hal character here, I needed this to sound completely different from every other monster in the game. It needed to sound horrific. Uh, Alex Preston, the di director, kept saying, like, make it sound really terrifying. I want to sound scared when I hear this. So what I did was squeal like a pig into a microphone and then process the hell out of it. <laughs> what? So what I'm going to play for you is my raw voice, which will sound awful, um, squealing like a pig into a microphone, and then the processed version. And You're going to do it live? No. Oh, come on. I actually thought I would. I was like, oh, maybe I should. And then... I realize how much it hurts to do this. <laughs> it's so painful. I'm not a voice actor by any means, but it was good for monster effects. So here's the raw version of me squealing like a pig. <laughs> so that's me. Um, <laughs> uh, this is pro stuff this right is, here. This is, real, this is the real art. Um, so now next up, what I did was record that directly into my wire recorder then put it back into Logic Pro, and to do that, there's no output on that thing. They didn't have those back then. Um, so what I did was just have it shove a microphone up against the speaker and then record it directly back into Logic Pro like it's an amp. And then what I did was take that sound that you just heard and time stretch it, reverb it, bit crush the hell out of it, and add some reverb, and this is the result. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yes, all it, all the monsters are start from this seed, but thanks to the magic of old and new technology, it starts to sound a lot more unique and a part of this world. They all started from that one sound. Every single one. <laughs> Every single. One. <laughs> uh, so um, have you guys have you guys noticed these things and what they sound like? Anybody? Okay, so this, so uh, the, the sound of uh, Hyperlight was something that uh, Alex and I started talking about. Uh, um, I think it was just a random idea that I had, and he's like, yeah, that's cool, we should, we should try that. So um, this is what those things sound like. Oh, wow. Gotta go to the gym, hold on. The gym. Um, there we go. <laughs> oh, 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 man. Go, go back? Yep. So this is just like a subtle thing that uh, we decided to do to kind of like, you know, what, what is the sound of Hyperlight? Does it have a sound? And, you know, there are these like, there are these little modules and stuff and pink stuff like in corners of, of like most of the rooms in the world. Uh, and so, you know, we, we made the sound and um, the, the sound is singular. So no matter how many of those objects that you have in a room, you just hear the one sound 
which I thought was kind of like a cool thing. Uh, I'm assuming almost nobody notices, but that's okay. <laughs> it's a nice touch. <laughs> oh, this is me. This is you. Uh, so ambiences. So this is a funny thing. Um, we we kind of you know Akash set off in the sound design world, uh, and you know had a lot had his hands pretty full with figuring out these sounds, and I kind of set off in a music world doing music, and I was doing a little bit of ambience like as part of the music uh, at times, but not always. And at some point towards the end of development, we kind of re realized like, we should probably have some ambiences in this game. That would probably That's help important. a lot. And it made a huge difference. Um, and so basically, um, I was like, hey, Kosh, is it cool if I just like start making ambiences? Because I, you know, I like, didn't want to step on your feet. Yeah. He was fine. like, cool, go yeah. for it. Save and me so, all the time. Yeah, so I just started making ambiences for the game. Um, and I actually hired an intern whose name is Curtis Mitchell who uh, helped me, uh, and um, you know, he just kind of did a lot of foundational work for me, and then I would come in and like, we'd kind of do the right effects to the sounds, and make you know, we'd do like spotting sessions where we'd play and be like, oh, this needs a sound, this needs a sound. Um, and uh, um, we did not use bit crushers. Actually, there's no, there's no bit crushing in the music or the ambience, um, and there's a ton of bit crushing in the sound um, effects, yeah. which is something that we, I think just kind of happened <laughs> yeah. out of luck yeah. and helped to like create, I think, a good contrast between the sounds and the music. So you, mm -hmm. it helps with the, I guess, the communication yeah. level of the uh, of the sounds. Yeah. Um, so yeah. yeah. So we did a lot of iteration on this whole sort of process in this game. There, basically, for me at least, nothing was really right on the first try. Um, I think only one sound, which was the railgun, is still at version one. And I, I wish I took a screenshot of this, but Alex said, I want to marry this sound. It's like, yes, yes. Um, but everything else hit version two and above. Again, some. I can hear that sound in my head. Yeah, uh, yes, That's awesome. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so a lot of things took a good amount of time and a good amount of iteration to really get right. Um. Sorry. No, no, no worries. Uh, yeah, so uh, the West music was something that uh, uh, went through a lot of iteration. Um, there were multiple versions of things. Uh, it kind of reached this point in the project where I thought, you know, maybe I should like, maybe I should write everything at the piano and like figure out the entire these long like five six minute songs and then notate them and maybe that will help me. And that was like that was the wrong, totally the wrong decision. That didn't help at all. It was a total waste of time. <laughs> but uh, we I kind of over time figured out that, oh, yeah, the music should probably be like these shorter pieces, but have a lot of different variations of it so that the music can react very quickly. And we were also somewhat limited technically by the software that we used, which we'll talk about in a little bit later. Um, and so, you know, that was a really important thing. And then another really important thing was um, this idea of kind of reappropriating my own ideas from the past. And this is something that I always bring to projects. Um, I have a huge database of just musical ideas from when I very, from the very beginning that I started writing music. And so, you know, I'll often like go back and find an idea from like six years ago that's like, oh yeah, this might work for this particular thing. Cool. And then I'll, you know, I'll, you know, dress it up so that it fits the project. Um, and a lot of times when I'm stuck or, you know, just looking to mix it up, that helps a lot. And, um, did, oh, I think we forgot to use that. No, that's all right. Okay, so we'll just skip over. <laughs> Actually, no, I'll just mention it a little yeah, bit. Yeah. There's this funny thing. It's called uh, uh, Teddy Diefenbach, who's a programmer on on Hyperlight. He uh, he uh, put this like this secret sound effect in the game called Shack Jack, which confused the hell out of me when I. So found when it. you're like when you're editing, when you're using the game editor, like it was kind of like maybe there's a one percent chance that when you hit the save the save button, save level, it would yeah. it would you'd hear Teddy going. Shack Jack. <laughs> <laughs> so when I discovered SND underscore Shack Jack in the Game Maker thing, I was like, what the? What, what is, is this? this? I didn't put this uh, here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so um, I, I can't believe I forgot to put this in the talk, but basically, the, um, uh, I, just, uh, I just just messing around with the sound one day, and I was like, wow, this is, if you like pitch this down and start to mess with it, like granular effects and stuff, it kind of sounds like the boss. Yeah. So actually, when you uh, in the boss room, when you first open the door, you hear Teddy going, Shack Jack. It works really well. I think it works pretty well. It's pretty funny. <laughs> so we stuck that in there. <laughs> Thanks, Teddy, oh. wherever you are. I have a sound. Okay. All right. So what I did, what well, kind of how how we kind of started to get uh, better and better at 
working on stuff is just through trying and trying again. Again, like not for me at least, nothing was really right on the first try except for that one railgun sound. So Alex was really, really good at using super descriptive emotional words, which for sound designers is super freaking rad. I really, really like using that. If someone says make this sound lonely or make this sound desolate or whatever it may be, I'm a huge, huge fan of that. So for example, one of the sounds that we created was this kind of frog enemy dying. So I'm gonna play you version one. So that's a frog dying, um, being stabbed. Ouch. Ouch. But not ouch enough, Rich. So, oh. <laughs> uh, so what Alex said was something along, along the lines of like, I want this to sound like agonizing. I want this to feel kind of sad or just kind of slow, disgusted a little bit when, when, when this thing dies. So again, using my beautiful angelic voice, this is what ended up being the end frog death sound. <laughs> so just... That thing didn't want to die, Dang. but it did. <laughs> Dang, that's gnarly. Uh, and then on the music side of getting better, uh, you know, Alex and I had many, many very long philosophical discussions about the music and kind of what he was looking for and what my agenda was. And that was something that was really nice about Alex is that, you know, he had a very strong vision for what he wanted, but he was also willing to like you know, for us to have these discussions about, you know, how, kind of how I saw the project and, you know, what I was bringing to the table. And um, we often found the right solution to things by just having these really long conversations and talking it out and kind of finding our common ground and reaching, like, the, the better I understood what his vision was, the, the more it informed my vision and, and I kind of allowed him to influence me and I think it was kind of, you know, a two-way street in that regard. Um, and so, you know, one thing that we kind of figured out you know, Alex wanted a lot of melody in the game, and I didn't really want any melody. I wanted it to be really subtle because, for me as an art as an artist, I'm very like, I'm very uh, cognizant of of not wanting to do the same thing over. And so, you know, coming from like, a, to me, this was in some ways a spiritual successor for me to 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 the work I did on Fez. And but Fez is very like melodic, and so I wanted to do something that was a much more kind of understated in in that regard. But we kind of reached this compromise where, you know, for and it's not really a compromise because I agree with it now, but basically for like bosses and vistas, which were these moments where, you know, you might see a titan, like a big, big dead robot way in the distance, we'd have the music kind of sweep, sweep up and kind of get kind of cinematic and have some kind of melody. And everything else is kind of more subtle. So I think it helps to build kind of this, this contrast and this kind of dynamism in the music. And then also in that same regard, you know, one of the things I took from Fez was that we used ambience a lot to create space and to give the player a chance to breathe between areas and things like that. So there are, there are a lot of moments in the game where there's, there's no music, it's just ambience, just to kind of like give the player a beat, give the player a moment to kind of catch their breath and things like that. Kind of play the game, kind of get a feel for what the, uh, the momentum of the game is, the, 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 the rhythm of the game basically, and kind of see you know where, where can I kind of push the emotions, where can I like, help the player like relax a little bit, especially in a game like this that's so demanding and, and can get really kind of frustrating. Um, it was important to have, to try to f inject some moments where the player could maybe feel a little bit more relaxed. Yeah. So we worked remotely, Rich and I, uh, he, you were in Berkeley at the moment? I was in Berkeley at the time. Yeah. And I was in Seattle. So we were remote while everyone else was at Glitch City in LA and we used, Slack was the best. Slack was everything. It was literally everything. Yeah. It was such a huge help. Um, we used Asana as well to kind of track bugs, but it was not kind of the best. Everyone used Asana, really. Yeah. Uh, I don't really like Asana, but we did use it to track bugs. Yeah, I used it to track a few assets here and there, but really I just made a Google spreadsheet, and that's kind of the, the best way to do it. And at least on my end, Alex and I had weekly calls to work, this, work stuff out. Even if we had nothing to update one another on, we made sure to get on Skype or on the phone, just be like, hey, how are you doing? Good, cool, anything this week? Nah, all right, see ya. Like, even if it was that, that was really helpful to make sure as working remotely that I wasn't forgotten or that I didn't forget them to keep working on whatever was needed. And it was really helpful in case an enemy got cut or a huge feature got cut or something got added. I was made sure to stay in the loop because in the early days of this project, we didn't have that set up and that kind of led to some stuff like, oh, I'm finished this sound for this thing. It doesn't exist anymore. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it was similar for me for a long time, just having you know, uh, periodic calls, uh, which were really helpful. But towards, uh, at some point, I, I 
you know, uh, the game was made in Los Angeles, and that's not that far. So I, I was like, you know, I should, I should just go there more, more often and hang out and get to know the team. And um, it'll be, you know, I think it'll be good. So I started doing that. I started going for weeks at a time uh, and, and staying at Alex's house, sleeping on his couch. And, uh, you know, I got to go to meetings with the team and, you know, hang out with the team and kind of get to know them. Um, but I still kind of isolated myself so that I could focus because it's hard to write music in, a, in like a co-working space. It's, it can be tough when there's no like designated area for you. Um, but it was good for morale, uh, I think, and it was good for being on the same page. And having, I think having closer relationships with the people that you work with just kind of, it, it, it boosts accountability for me personally, and it, it, it makes me want to do a good job even more. Yeah. So a lot of people asked me, and I'm probably you as well, like how did we kind of work together to get things done? And we didn't. Um, so in all honesty, so we didn't... <laughs> We didn't do this intentionally. We just, we're not like, oh, I hate you, Rich. Let's never talk again. Um, what kind of happened is that we talked throughout, at the very beginning of the project when I was brought on on a Skype call, laid some things out here and there that I don't even remember. And then uh, throughout wow. the rest of the three-year project, we maybe chatted three or four times. Yeah, very infrequently. Yeah. If it wasn't for Alex, who was kind of, it was kind of like a triangle. Like he was kind of, you know, he was funneling both of us. Yeah. If it wasn't for him, I mean, we, prob we might have ended up with totally... <laughs> Totally different, yeah, unrelated knows. work, yeah. And looking back, we sh should have. Yeah, talked we probably more. <laughs> should have talked more. It would have been good. And I think, I think there was something where the the maybe the the whatever our connection was just wasn't quite gelling or something. Because yeah, I don't, I don't no, know. No, no, yeah, but it, I don't know. It worked out. Who knows? It worked out okay. So we used Game Maker for getting all of our sounds and music into the game, which was a little bit of a challenge. Yeah, we didn't intentionally use Game Maker, but Game Maker is the software that was right. used for the game. And, uh, you know, they, they were really helpful, actually, in kind of iterating on Game Maker itself to give us the tools that we needed to do a good job. Mm -hmm. um, and so they, uh, they helped us with things like adding Ogvorbis support and uh, doing, um, doing things with like adding more uh, memory support for like streaming multiple streams of, of uh, music and things like that. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, we also had two programmers who were super helpful, mm -hmm. uh, extremely. extremely helpful and, and wanted to you know, do good by us. And so, um, uh, yeah, so um, we did we did a lot of uh, um, kind of mixing uh, and kind of uh, uh, things where you know music kind of changes uh, over time um, by using uh, uh, a script editor. This is a screenshot, an early screenshot of the editor. It's kind of nuts. <laughs> um, it's it's not ideal, but you know it does the job and mm -hmm. um, it, it helped in the long run for everybody. Yeah. So basically, we had this visual scripting language where you know we we uh, we would place sounds, we would place music in the world. There were little boom boxes, which was kind of fun. That was cute. Uh, and you could attach them to different things, like regions where the character, if the character walks into this region, you know, you do a thing with the music, you fade it in, you fade it out, whatever. And also, we had this, we had group, a group system for the music. So you know, you could have a bunch of different versions of the same track that kind of crossfade between each other. Um, uh, and then we had things like, uh, um, oh yeah, like we did a lot of conditional music triggering. So based on the position of the player, camera events, like special camera events, like when you see the the uh, the jackal, if you know the jackal character. Hands over. Um, spoiler. Uh, uh, enemy events, like if all the enemies are dead, do this, or if one of the enemies is dead, do this. Special events, etc. You know, no middleware. It was all like directly in in the editor with everybody else. We were all kind of working in the same tool, which was interesting. It was interesting. It's good and bad. Uh, yeah. And uh, we we actually one one last thing that I want to say is that I had Teddy build this system um, for positional ambiences. So you know, we were doing ambiences for the game, but the ambiences were like general ambiences, like wind that you hear everywhere. And at some point, I realized you know there were a lot of like these little sounds like like um, torches, like uh, lamps, uh, the things that are like, like the hyperlight stuff, that, that, that is all positional. So, you know, he helped, he helped build this system where, you know, you could, have, you could have sounds in the environment that you could walk past and they would, you know, get louder, get quieter. It's not rocket science. It's been in games for a long time, but it wasn't something that, I don't think it was something that Game Maker really did, so we had, we had to build it. So... This question I'm sure we'll get a lot just so, just so we can cover it now. 
Um, for me, on my end, for software and sound design and all that sort of good stuff, I use Logic Pro. Nowadays, I use Nuendo and Reaper for all that sort of stuff. But Logic Pro is great. All the built-in plugins are fantastic. Lots of bit crushers. The built-in bit crusher in Logic is what I used a lot of. And that helped a ton. It was actually quite good. And for synths and a lot of things like Massive and Complete or uh, Absinthe and all that sort of stuff, I use Native Instruments Complete. It's a great sort of all-in-one package for music and sound design software. I really, really liked it. I also use reverb a lot. That was my favorite effect and still is to this day. It's like the fairy dust of the music and sound design world. Just put more on and it'll be better. Uh, but I used um, uh, Audio Damage EOS, EOS, which was like the darkest, most beautiful sounding reverb with an infinite setting. So I really like that. Cool. Um, I use a lot of... Uh I used Massive almost uh, exclusively for the music. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a synth that I'm really comfortable with. And um, I wanted to do something different than what we did with Fez, so I very early on decided I don't want to use any bit crushers at all. Um, so we kind of went for a more tape analog kind of sound. Mm -hmm. um, and so I you know, kind of played a lot, tried to play a lot with um, saturation and distortion, and also baking things into the signal chain to kind of like uh, you know, if you, 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 can, you can put reverb at the end of a, the signal chain on a sound and then it sounds like it's in a room. But if you use it really early in the signal chain and you mess with the stereo imaging, like you can, you can put like a mono reverb on a sound and then you can bake things on top of that and then it becomes a texture. And so uh, I tried to use reverb a lot as a texture, as like mm -hmm. a tool to kind of paint and create like different textures for sounds. Yeah. And, um, oh, we already said that. Oh, yeah. yeah. I think me not using bit crushers and you using bit crushers yeah, kind of helps. It made the sound stick the out sound separately stand, the from sound the music. Stand out. Yeah. So lastly, before we finish up, we just have a few takeaways for you, just kind of lessons we learned on how to work with us audio folk. So the first thing is hire early, as, or as early as you can. And that's always a nice thing to have. It is a little bit typical to see audio kind of brought in at the very last moment. And that's no good. Um, having the ability to kind of fail upwards with the rest of the team is always really appreciated for all disciplines. I always like to say that game development is nothing but a whole bunch of people failing until something happens. Um, so make sure that your audio people also have that ability to fail and grow upwards with the rest of the team. I mean, this one I don't, I'm not sure I agree with, but it's okay. <laughs> yeah, it's all right. Go I for mean, it. I ha mean, have opinions ready, but don't micromanage. I think, that, I think that's nice if, you can, if, if you're someone who has strong opinions, but it's also okay to be yeah. someone who, you know, it's like, hey, I really like what you, what you do, and I, I, want, I want to see what your, your vision is for this project. To bring someone in and, and have them self-direct is also okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But I think in general, micromanaging is something that nobody really likes. Yeah, so. agreed. So like we mentioned, allow a lot of time for experimentation, that failure and all that stuff, because you can get a lot of weird results of letting that kind of time yeah. really cook and bake and all that sort of stuff. Um, especially if you're like, hey, Akash, here's a week where you can just record some stuff. I'm like, I'm going to build a stethoscope microphone. Um, so if you give enough time, that sort of nonsense starts to happen. And it can be for the better of the game. Uh, and don't let, don't let us work together, because it's bad. <laughs> because it's a bit, no, just kidding. Just kidding. Oh, we should have talked more, for sure. So that's it. Thank you so much for coming. We'll have some quest time for questions now. So yeah, we have time for a few questions. If you have a question, come to the mic in the center aisle, please. Come up to the mic. Hey, how's it going? Hello. Uh, so uh, this is generally more towards like the music side of things, but it can definitely be used for both. Um, during your, your creative processes, I was curious if you find yourself getting into any patterns and you finding anything similar that you do in your ideas and how you work around that. Um, that's an interesting question. I think, I think it's important to uh, acknowledge patterns um, and kind of lean into the ones that you like and kind of try to work your way out of the ones that you don't like. And one of the things that I've always tried to do is to iterate on the creative process itself. So if, if, uh, if I find that what I'm doing is stale, I'll, I'll, I'll try to go back to the drawing board and be like, you know, maybe, maybe, I should, um, maybe I should change the actual way I'm writing. So if I'm writing at the piano, maybe I'll write at the guitar. If I'm writing at the guitar, maybe I'll use flashcards like I did, or I'll, I'll use, uh, I, I like to build um, like generative music tools. So, you know, I try to have a lot of different options uh, so that I can keep it fresh. Cool. All right. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Yeah. 
Hi, um, I was wondering, so with the shotgun, you had nine separate sounds. What was your process? They were all different. Yeah. I doubt you just randomly said, hey, here's nine sounds. How's that sound? Like, how did you but, make that? What, why did you decide that? Ah, uh, good question. So basically how I kind of decided for all the weapons, basically, let's say it's a shotgun. I made sure to know that, okay, my seed is a shotgun, so I'm going to have some sort of gunshot sort of layer in here at the very least. That's a good starting point. Then from there I know, okay, this is the diamond shotgun. I should make this sound really crystalline. What sorts of crystalline sounds can I get? Cool, okay, so I'm gonna start recording like me. I, I bought a belly dancer scarf for like a dollar on, off of Amazon, Amazon's the best, um, for a dollar and just shook it around and pitched it up. So okay, there's a crystalline sound. Now I want something that sounds kind of bassy and thuddy so it has some impact to it. What sort of bassy thud could I get? And then I kind of go from high, middle, and low frequencies from there to see what I can fill out. That's usually how I approach this. Sometimes it is like, I'm gonna put a tiger growl in here and see if it sounds good. There's a lot of experimentation, when, especially when I'm stuck. But in general, I, I break things out into frequency spectrum, kind of a seed that I'm starting with, and then go from there. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Hey, uh, I actually have two questions now with a follow-up to that. With the shotgun, you mentioned you want to use all the frequency. Is that mainly because it's a weapon, or do you do you want certain sounds to not occupy the whole range? Yeah, so for example, I don't want the footsteps to occupy the whole range because that would drown out Okay, music so it's like a giant monster. Unless it's a huge monster or something very important. Right. Um, so when it's something that I need to just sound like, oh, that's cool or that's impactful, I feel powerful, that's when I want to occupy, not necessarily all, but a good chunk of them, especially bass. Okay. So and that's how I kind of play with it. Cool, thank you. My original question is, in the project I'm working on, I'm fighting music with my room tones or ambience, like they kind of either don't go together, like the music might be happy but you're in a cave and maybe that's just a bad way to do it. Is it, do you guys use effects like stereoization to keep things separate? Like you have the bit crusher and that was yeah, a good I mean, difference. For, for music and ambience, um, uh, I think part of the reason that I, I kind of pushed for doing the ambience is I, I knew it would be easier for us. It would yeah. take less time if I did both. Um, when, you're, when you're trying to make music and ambience fit together, um, it's, I think it's important to treat ambience like an element in the mix of your music. Um, and so, uh, you know, a thing that I tended to do with, with ambience is, um, like you said, you know, do stereo stuff where you push the ambience really wide mm -hmm. and also um, use, uh, pretty much always would use um, a high pass filter. Okay, great, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Hey, thanks. <clears throat> um, I wanted to start by, uh, Rich, you had said earlier that you I don't know if this was true of all of the soundtrack, but you were talking about creating a music system that would cycle through all of the different key signatures. So my question is for Akash, in, the, in, in that case, when you're doing um, musical sound effects, how do you make those not clash with a constantly changing key signature? Yeah, I actually remember asking you, yeah. what key is this in? You're like, I don't know. <laughs> that was your response. Yeah, I mean, uh, most of the music is kind of all, it's all over the place. So. Right. Because it was all over the place, it never was I think an we issue. just decided, why don't you just do, it, just do what you're going to do, and then we'll just listen, and if it works, it works. And I think ultimately that's the most important thing is using your ears. Yeah. If, and it didn't clash when we put it. If, we, if it did clash when we put it in, I would have changed it. Right. Um, but when it came in, it sounded totally fine, so we just left it. Awesome. That's kind of how it worked. All right. Thank you so much for coming. Thank I'll you. be wandering around, so feel free to <laughs> same chat and all that.